Hi, Shazia. Hi. How are you? I am well, thank you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us to talk about your fantastic exhibition, Weeping Willows Liquid Tongues. It's now on view at the gallery. And for those of you who can't make it to the gallery, we have an excellent online virtual presentation as well. So you can enjoy the exhibition that way. But first, let's look at an image of the exhibition so you can be enticed for what you might see when you come. And Shazia, I should mention that this is your first exhibition with Sean Kelly. Yes. And your first exhibition in New York in some time. So just at the outset, before we get into the works specifically, I'd love to know just, even though I know a little bit about what you were thinking, what you were hoping to accomplish with this presentation that you've worked so long and so hard on? Um, not, not an easy question, I know. No, I think um, in terms of the curation of the exhibition, um, in our conversations, you know, with you, with Janine, Sean, I, I, I wanted to share uh, the range of works that I'd been working on. So the work as it has developed in the last, whatever, decade, where there's been um, simultaneous engagement with public artworks and glass and light and mosaic, um, as well as far more ambitious multi-channel animation works that have that had developed. So, um, so there was this desire to show the um, interdisciplinary nature of the work as well as the multilingual nature too. And, um, and I, I think that's the sort of thrust of the show. And, and that's very much a, a, a nature, the, in the nature of your work, the interdisciplinary aspect, different materials, different languages, different cultures coming together. And, you know, I'm not sure that everyone who knows your work knows the breadth of it. And so I think that this exhibition is revelatory in that way. And one of the many revelations, I guess I should say, is that you created your first sculpture for this exhibition. And this is one view of it. It's in bronze. Let me just show a few details of that so you can see it from the back. And this work is titled Promiscuous Intimacies. And I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about the two figures and how you selected them and what this interrelationship between the two female figures symbolizes across cultures, across our historical disciplines, across uh, boundaries. Yes. Um, so yeah, so the sculpture, though, it's the first time uh, in this, uh, of working in bronze for me. Um, you know, the nature of the work is uh, very much the DNA that's there, that's always been there. And even in terms of the protagonists that I culled out of my practice, they have been in and out of my work in multiple ways. There's this uh, constant sort of thread of, of female um, archetypes that, that, that have been present in, in the drawings and paintings. So this, um, this particular uh, piece was very much uh, came about also in conversation with um, other uh, thinkers and authors, and in particular, Guy Three uh, Gopinath, who has written um, an essay on my work uh, uh, in the upcoming um, monograph. But in our discussions, and especially in terms of how to sort of reframe so much of my work that was happening in the 90s and later, and uh, think in terms of like, you know, um, um, uh, other ways of um, uh, of engaging with it that she uh, I'm going to just read what she had um, expressed that was the genesis for this for this particular piece was that the suggestive embrace which is the intertwined female bodies that they bear the symbolic weight of communal identities that are from multiple temporal and geographic terrains they evoke non-heteronormative desires that are often cast as foreign and inauthentic and instead challenge the viewer to imagine a different present and future. So this backward glance 
demands that we both understand tradition, culture, identity as impure, heterogeneous, unstable, and always in process. So which, you know, which disrupts the art historical boundaries, so to speak. Right. And, and I think that again, brings it back to the entire premise of the show that it is between, caught between languages, caught between um, histories and between um, dichotomies that are broad, like even nature and human and women and power and migrant and citizens. So in that respect, I think the images are, are far more sort of, they, they are, they're more archetypal. And I should just mention the you spoke about the the essay. This is in a forthcoming um, exhibition. There's a book to support it called Shazia Sikander, Extraordinary Realities. And it has many excellent essays. And the one that you just mentioned is particularly uh, informative. And that it will accompany an exhibition that opens at the Morgan Library and then travels to the Houston Museum of Fine Arts and then comes home to RISD, which is the organizing institution and where you went to school in the United States. So it's a, it's a wonderful sort of circle that's being completed in terms of where you began your education to this mature artist and also uh, a text, a group of texts that really explicates your work, I think in a way that hasn't been done. So that's something that people can really um, celebrate when that book comes out. So moving through the exhibition, we have uh, three films. So it's a little mini survey of your animations, the most recent one, Reckoning, which we see here, and two others, which we'll refer to uh, momentarily. And at the end of this presentation, we will show the animation um, in motion with its beautiful soundtrack. And maybe you can speak to that and your collaborators, but I just wanted to show uh, these stills to give one a sense of what is happening in the film. And maybe you could address the content of Reckoning here a little bit, and then we'll watch it at the end. Yeah, definitely. So again, I think in the nature of animation, so much of it is about forms that lend themselves to a kinetic uh, process. And I've been working with animation now for almost 20 years. So, you know, before, inter before HD as well, and I think it was a very natural um, uh, direction simultaneously happening in terms of developing iconographies and forms within the actual practice of my drawing. Right. And, um, and so this, this is, it, it, it is in that same um, um, ethos. It's, it takes forms that, uh, that are unraveling in time. So it's a joust of sorts between it could be between two warriors it can also be it can also it also is between nature and human um assault on the living planet it's also between life and death and um it starts with this um portrait of sorts which is like a female portrait looking down if you see on the left side and as it sort of hurls downward it uh, it's made up of like millions of um particles it just sort of it's it's kind of like a rite of passage and it mm -hmm. and it unravels and explodes and in that um in in that moment it it you see that you know um the the, the warriors or this tumbling act which is sort of this struggle between two forms is taking place and i think some of those drawings are also um uh, part of the exhibition so so the people that may be viewing the show are able to see um, the, the relationship between the drawings and, and, and the animated um, uh, aspect of the works too. It also has uh, towards the end, this, um, uh, this very sinuous nature of the tree that, that um, is kind of built on the lyrical, uh, depiction of nature, often in Persian uh, paintings. So it's I I thought of this work as a staging of a imaginary Indian Persian Turkish sort of like 
you know, it encompasses a, a, a geographic and stylistic region that I often have been um, mining and calling right. for, for my research. So it's a sort of a restaging of that idea. And um, the, the tree mimics some of the forms there, but it's also sort of the expulsion uh, from Eden. And, um, and then the next, the other, and uprootedness of that tree is really about, um, about our current sort of crisis. And in terms of, um, in terms of mi migrations and migratory patterns and the tensions between migrant and citizen. And then the other tree uh, is, you can see that it, it is struggling from the act of flowering. It doesn't want the burden to be, um, to flower. And that, that's another sort of tension there is with the tropes of, revolutionary poetry, which often deals with the idea of the garden or the um, notion of Acadia, and then, you know, the, the symbolic idea of the flowering as the birth, the, the, the future, the rebirth, the spring that comes in a cyclical manner. So there are those tensions that I play with. Um, and, and you brought up the, the opposition between two elements or two figures, which the binary, this uh, polar opposition is something that both as a trope and a visual um, cue runs through a lot of your work. And I think that we'll see it in some of the other pieces. I'd like to just address that when it comes up. Uh, for instance, there are two figures here, but let's talk more broadly about the mosaic itself and um, how this work in mosaic that moved into your practice. It's something that um, if you don't mind, I'll just move to this image because if I'm not incorrect, this is the first time you worked in mosaic on this scale. Is that correct, at Princeton? Yes, yes. That was, I think, 15, 16. And um, the scale is really large. It's about more than 70 feet from the bottom of the building all the way to, 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 its, um, to the height of the entire space. Um, again, I'll just, sure. We'll go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I'll just draw attention to this figure and this figure because they'll play a part in our latter discussion. But um, I just lo love to hear you talk more about your choice of the material. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, the engagement with mosaic, of course, first comes about when I had um, to sort of solve the idea of a permanent public artwork. So I wanted to work with materials with longevity in mind and also glass is very malleable and really um, how it uh, deals so much with light and that, that the language of that material and how drawing can then be, um, in, how I can bring drawing and glass together. So it was, it was really about understanding the, the material itself before just determining that here is a drawing and we need to reproduce it in mosaic. And I think that's, that's in general throughout the work, even how coming to mosaic technically comes from thinking a, through a digital space, how, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like how the pixel can be uh, drawn as a parallel to the unit of the mosaic. And that you know, opens up conceptually a very different way of engaging with the material, and right. um, and you were mentioning about the uh, about this sort of um, the binary notion, and yes, so I think like oftentimes um, what my what I'm intending to do is to break the binary, to sort of like think outside of the of the the the, the you know often projected onto the work would be you know either the east-west dynamic as just one of the more um, more of those tropes that are often you know um, projected onto the work so it's like how to think outside of it so that it's not as simple as black and white east or west American or out the outsider inside outsider and and all that sort of nuance the gray space in that spectrum is incredibly important. And that sort of is a, another thread that runs through the work. Um, in this particular uh, piece, uh, 
you know, you will see that the, the motif itself has evolved into this um, flower of sorts. And then that's echoed again as a, uh, in constitution of the globe, it's echoed in, in um, uh, the poppy flowers in, in uh, oil and poppy. So that there is that there, there, this emergence of the form also plays a, a, a part in throughout the piece itself. But in, uh, uh, in a rose, it has uh, sort of risen to the top and is, a, and, is a, and is buoyant and afloat, but it's still part of its natural environment. And yet sort of it's not, you know, it's not directly anchored to it, which is another way of um, thinking for me in terms of um, uh, continuing with the language of, of, of miniature painting, the stylization that exists within it, but finding kind of new ways of um, continuing that dialogue. And expanding that story. Yeah. And, um, and, and you- Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. And then you can see how so, uh, it, it takes on a very different vantage point to kinship. So if you move to, to this here too, you do see uh, again, perhaps two protagonists, but you know, very loosely it can be life and death or imagination and, and lack of imagination. And, um, and, and, and then um, how, you know, how they, they are at that point of tension so what is what is there? What is the nature of that relationship, or is it going to pull? Is it going to pull apart? And then you do see that you know in parallax where where these forms emerge, but but then they move further. They sort of uh, play on. They they sort of fall apart, uh, but they also disappear in and in there. It's in the body of liquid. So the reference is again to um, annals of time and history, and especially in maritime trade. So the idea of you know colonial uh, pathways, whether it's the maritime or air trade trade routes. So so the, so the, so in, in the exhibition itself, you will encounter this image again in multiple usage. Right. Uh, right. And, and I know from knowing your work well that there are sort of signal images that recur and are reintroduced and reappear in different guises, if we will, um, to tell different um, aspects of the story. And one of those, if you don't mind going back to Mosaic, is this figure without a head whose um, torso comes down to these tendrils, like it's been uprooted or the feet have been shredded in some way, let's say. And I believe if I'm wrong, you'll correct me, a slight and pleasing dislocation was one of the first uses or where this work, image was introduced. Yeah, Is that and correct? It, it, oh, yes, I think then and in, in, in several other works, I think it's almost like a mark of a kind of a signature image, but it's it has, um, it has uh, been used in multiple ways. It, I have embellished it and brought it out through scale and form and detail, you know, in different in different iterations. But if, even if it's reduced in its very reductive, um, iconic kind of emblematic nature, I think of it uh, as one of the um, languages in my practice, you know, then I'm, I'm kind of, I'm interested in how uh, certain forms can function as letters, as words that can, can be reorganized. And in their reorganization, you know, you are moving away from um, kind of a, a zone of, of that, that uh, a hierarchy of sorts. So it's, it's born from that premise but it also embodies that in its actual sort of shape. It's self-rooted, so it's self-referential and it's um, 
for very obvious uh, reasons. It's a, it's a very feminine form, so you can see that. It, it doesn't have a head, but that's probably because I wanted it to be more, um, a much more broader representation of- Universal. The, yeah. Then, I, then be hijacked by um, identity or a specific, um, specific notion of the female. I, I like that you referred to it as a text as well, because uh, in the previous image, we were looking at text, although we hadn't addressed it yet. And just to go back, you know, a step further, um, earlier in your career, you were well known, um, gathered a lot of attention for taking the tropes of uh, Indo-Persian miniature painting and making it contemporary, infusing it with a new language, if you will. And I think that many people you know, associate you with working in a very small scale, even though you've always worked in a very um, grand scale, even if in installations. But there is a centrality of the text and languages that runs through your work. And, and I'd love just to speak about the use of the Urdu text in these and several other drawings in the work, in the exhibition. Yeah, so um, again, uh, the idea of, of caught between languages. So the English-Urdu relationship is, uh, is a very um, um, empowering idea. And it's also a very complicated idea because again, it, it, I, I am deriving it from not just my own personal experience of, of uh, the sense of gain and loss when, when one coming out of you know colonial education and the histories the colonial histories that are that are that are present behind that have activated who gets to speak or who gets to be represented or own which which language so this idea of the foreign and the native language and the tensions there but i think also in terms of um the English language relationship around the globe. Mm -hmm. And then Urdu itself comes out of a script which is from Persian and, and Arabic. So there is a, a, a the, 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 the interest in that script itself. It's, it's something that I've, I've been, um, that has been part of my uh, practice and research because a lot of my work comes out of book art. So the idea of the image and text and their interrelationship, interrelationship. very present even because so many times, you know, if you look at the provenance of um, manuscripts, the they, text is an integral part, but so much of what we see has been pulled and torn out of out of the big fold books. So if you see something as a solo folio, often at times, if you unframe it, or you see it without the frame, there's, there's gonna be text either in the piece or behind the work. It may not necessarily be an illustration of that particular text, but the text is very present and oftentimes um, invisible or made invisible. So then again, I think the idea of uh, visibility and vi invisibility plays a part in terms of uh, how things get framed and curated and what gets placed within the frame and what, what gets placed outside. So that there's that too, in terms of this tension with language. And, and when you say curated, do you mean institutionally as well? Because you were speaking about how manuscripts as many of us come to know them, have been decontextualized, you know, taken out of their original um, books, let's say, and then they're represented in these cultural institutions, which are themselves accumulations of decontextualized objects that have been, you know, through colonization or whatever means, not all of them nefarious, but they've been artificially reconstructed, let's say. And is that something that you think about in your work, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I, absolutely. I, there is a sense of violence inherent in there, even in terms of the broader histories of looting and plundering. You know, in terms of so much art and artifacts and objects that, and as and archives it themselves, even in terms of 
um, policing the archives. You know, how now things perhaps are shifting and changing, but accessing the archives was itself a pretty difficult um, um, idea of like how, who gets to access what. And um, so much of, of the canon of, of painting, which is a, you know, which is the Indo-Persian, so much of it resides in, in storages in the West, in the West, in Western institutions. So for me to be interested in that language, often it has meant really digging in, into those uh, storages, into those archives. And uh, I'm always interested in the stuff which is yet to be published or right. that, that may not net yet be archived. So in that sense, it's technically perhaps not even visible. So this idea of, of and then of course the tearing, the, the, the nature of isol, uh, tearing single pages and thinking of them as single artworks is very different from the fact that they were made to exist um, together in a book. As a narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so then you think of them as a singular idea, they are often removed from their original context. And then in the act itself is very violent. And, and, that, and then they, had, they were put on the secondary market for that intent right. to, you know, it would be, you could, they'd probably be more expensive to sell single pages than to try to uh, sell and sell the book. Right. So that, all of that history, the provenance of these objects definitely is um, something that the work also is engaged with. Well, in terms of, we're looking at kinship again, which is, a, it's a drawing, it's also, it's a painting, it's large scale, it's in, incredibly impressive, but there are also beautiful works in the exhibition which are more discreet, um, that can be held in the hand. Um, we've displaced some of them in vitrines where you can look down on them. And this is one of the gorgeous drawings that's in the show, one of the last works to enter the exhibition the day that it opened, <laughs> I think. But here you have um, this figure recurring that we see in one version in a rose and it's echoed in other drawings that we'll see. And it's a multi-headed figure. And that again goes to the duality that you were discussing in terms of identities and nationalities. And I would just love with this and these two drawings, if you'd address that a little bit further. Yes. Um, so that was the last work to enter the show, but it was the first work <laughs> to build the show. <laughs> Whatever reasons I, I was not, I maybe had forgotten about it, but it was. Um, All the ideas. Yeah. The genesis was in that drawing, right? Definitely, it's one of the one of those group of drawings that sparked so many threads that are uh, running through this this particular exhibition. So this, yeah, the multi-headed avatar, again, a trope that has come in and out of my work in many other ways. Sometimes it's, it uses the sort of this idea of multiplicity through kind of, you know, monstrous forms or it uses the animal and breaks the sort of the relationship between the animal and the, and the human or the animate and the inanimate. But here it's really, I think, um, the, the, about generative in terms of like the multiplicity of women. So maybe my way of saying that we need more diversity, intellectual diversity, even in, in, in our space of feminism, you know, mm -hmm. in particular. I, I want to address these two works because they're, they're graphite, they're um, delicate, as you can see, they're a little bit difficult to see maybe in this image, but they're also the level of detail and precision so I'd like to talk just a little bit about process because I think it's, uh, there is um, a film we made with you, I think where you were actually working on one of these and the, the instrument is the most fine pointed piece of graphite I've ever seen in my life. And so I wonder what the, not just the intellectual, but the contemplative process is when you're working on something which must be incredibly time consuming and um, carefully, must be carefully done. Yeah, all of it. I think 
a craft and time and labor and attention to detail and you know and and sort of the way pigment functions in conversation with with the surface like all these are important very important aspects that that I um, place on on my work. It, like I want the encounter to be incredibly emotional and visceral, and um, and so you know, so the idea of like detail is not that it's all just the embellished detail, but it's the detail which is introspective, which I think is different from um, in a, a kind of um, yeah, ornate detail. And, uh, and even again, it, it's not a very good image, but the, the piece on the left, every single detail is there, like the gesture of the hand, the nail, the nail, the, the, um, the, the hand, the finger, the nail, the eye, you know, the, 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 the intimacy between the two. And then at the same time, there is this, they go in and out of a a geometry of forms where there's a play with the star of David. There's a play with the with the crescent with <laughs> with the five pointed star. So it's these multiple points of entry into entry, the, yeah yeah that can go from you know depending on however the viewer whatever the viewer brings <laughs> from a very from not just a culturally specific place, but it can be a political space. It can be a, it can be a historically um, disrupting space also. Well, one of the great elements of the exhibition is the fact that you can see in terms of scale and media, we looked at um, the Arose mosaic earlier. This has a relationship to that. And then certainly uh, the Arose drawing, which um, is on the left, and, and the form, and we'll talk about the X's and the O's in a moment, but the centrality of this global form, we could call it, that echoes throughout the work. And, and uh, I would love you to speak about that for just a moment. The, this arose, can you tell me where this came in terms of when the mosaic was made and when the drawing was made? Yeah, the, the, the first drawing that we saw with the women and the and, and that the one before, so you know yeah you can see how what I've done is basically I was trying to I, I as I was thinking about the form being generative, how to um, take the static representation of the female figure which is often placed against a background and, and whether it can be architectural or landscape, but it's often a side profile with a very particular use of the skirt. So this sort of stylization that's recurrent, I, I kind of wanted to um, play on that and the way it becomes repetitive is this takes on a circular motion. And in that act, in that motion itself, is coming because those are ways that in which you know things will get animated to see how an image can function in time and space and whether it can um, it can have the legibility of motion and the grace of movement or all these things. So in my that sort of that's where the thinking sort of takes on where drawing can function in partnership with other languages and often you know I'm thinking literally of drawing as a libretto and even through the show that's how I, I was imagining it and um, so you can see all the connections that this particular drawing has with both the painted uh, a rose as well as the mosaic version and in that painting if you can move forward uh, Jeffrey to uh, the painting of a rose the armature is very architecture textural. You, it's again um, hard to see it here, but the details are very elaborate, painted with hand and gold, and they have a different type of of um, experience versus the interior, which which for me seemed as if it had been hollowed out. So it could mm -hmm. be, it could 
you know, it, it, it felt like it had been bombed out. So this sort of tension between um, things that operate on being developed and built and, and areas that operate as if they have been expunged and removed or, you know, destroyed. So, they, so these sort of two tensions that run through the piece too, especially they get heightened when the subject matter deals a, a, a more specifically with women. And I think that's my way of showing uh, women in power and women in context to history and, you know, so much of female um, histories have either, you know, they exist from the perspective often of, of, of a male perspective, but also um, so much of their stories have been expunged over time. So there, there's this play on that. Um, so we've discussed the, the, the centrality of, of the, the global um, form. And then another strong element visually is this X, this chromosomal X perhaps, um, sometimes incorporating language or rather text. Um, and I'd love to maybe focus on these works, I'll show a closer up detail of X as it is titled. Um, and again, you've used the Urdu text and all the texts um, in the different works are drawn from one particular um, text, if you would like to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the, the word, the, the reference is very much, you know, the, the, the phrases are coming from the poet Ghalib's uh, various Ghazal's poems. Ghalib, you know, Ghalib is as, is as epic as Shakespeare. <laughs> so when I say Ghalib, we should, like, it's not like something very unknown, but so that's one of the reasons why um, uh, for me to reference Ghalib was, you know, the, the, that the ease in which I reference is something that I wanted to um, make it like stage it as, as a center. It's, it's centrally staged. I offer the translation if, if re required but the translation itself is in dialogue with the use of Urdu. So if you observed carefully, you will see that the English and Urdu both are playing an equal role in creating the image itself. And then the image, the X can have multiple connotations. It's either, you know, set, where is the narrative centered? Is it centered right here? in the exhibition itself or is it are we uh, am i playing with this idea that you know i'm centering my work or my story is at the center which of course as an artist that's at the center of your production but it's often right. about being constantly placed as the underrepresented narrative you know in conversations around who gets to participate in in say the canon of american art so that's one way, was one way of thinking, okay, is where, do, where does the center reside? And is it constantly a target? Is it constantly moving and shifting? And, and that when you up, come up close, you see how, how active the, the font is, how active the writing is, how repetitive it is, which is also playing with the idea of rote, with the idea of, you know, um, accumulation. But with accumulation, there's always loss. So it gets right. written over. And this repetitive idea is again about, you know, um, um, layers, layer, layered histories. Histories are not one dimensional. Societies, histories, they are, they are multidimensional. They are, they are alive, they're not static. So there's that. In this, the reference is really to this, to this mythic tale of, of um, Rustam and Sorab, and so which is a which is hinting at the cyclical nature of violence. The father kills the son, and um, without and then you know the remorse of that, but the son is dead, and then this sort of epic tale and story. How I how I'm referencing that, but I've also abstracted it. But so this play is between um, uh, something which is how ink can become mythic. 
you know, how like the, the gesture itself of writing and construction itself is mythic. So the reference is mythic, but then the, that's how I'm imagining this separation between um, citing something historically, something that exists within the template of miniature painting history. It's also very mythic, like a, a, a mythic poem. And then also in the act of writing between both languages and the accumulation of ink itself, how that performs a role. So many, many, many ways of entering this work. Right, and and the density of it too, it, it plays a powerful role in that and yeah, composition. And the, absolutely, and then in the accumulation of like the drips as it's dripping, it started to create this sort of um, X and then, you know, recognizing that that X is forming. So you see it and you don't, it's almost like, like a curtain. It's got right. so, so much texture and layer. And then of course it's ink and water. So the red starts to bleed too. And then the circle is again, could be the bleeding poppy, which is as a symbol, um, again, comes in tropes of um, revolutionary poetry often. You know, the, there are all these great connections among work that seem, you know, maybe visually very disparate. And you mentioned a little bit earlier um, this work in the center, but this group of four really stunning large scale works, which are referred to as Christmas trees. Um, perhaps you could tell a little bit about the iconography as well as the symbolism in this grouping. Yeah. Again, at the at the er, like the early stages of of the the discussions around the exhibition, the one of the main one of the things that I kept returning to was this paradox between extraction and abundance, and that's that's where I I, I think I kind of um, that was the genesis of sorts for the exhibition that what is extractive, how can what how can I create iconographies that that will elaborate this idea of extraction. And then what is the counter narrative? So what is it that, uh, that allows abundance to be understood or to be experienced? And is that extractive things, you know, uh, is that the assault on the planet? Is it extraction of resources? Is it the capitalist notion around the movement of resources? So based on the, on some of those ideas the 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 iconographies were also derived from other works that i'd been working on uh, for example like um uh, the uh, parallax which which deals with the strait of hormuz and the histories of oil but uh, we 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 can return Come back to the trees, but like the, the tree, the, the in the mo in in some section, I think of parallax. The trees emerge, but then basically uh, it's like a, a a whole forest of trees, and that idea is there for a moment, and then it just sort of crumbles as as if it's a mirage, and then uh, it's swept off to one side, and then I was like, you know, I mentioned the I cite the trees in this very fleeting moment in parallax what if i explore that notion further so these drawings are then uh four different directions and can you, can you just mention for those who don't know as we do what the oil derrick is that yeah. that image in here so yes, so that image which looks like a christmas tree is actually my version of the oil rig so when I encountered the, the photographs in British Petroleum Magazine while doing research, the oil rigs that do not look like Christmas trees, but for whatever reasons were called Christmas trees. So this idea that, you know, that they may have the gift bearing sentiment is being projected on, onto the idea of the oil, but at the same time, the form had no correlation to Christmas trees. So that gave me this place where I could develop the accumulation of, of the, the spools and the chains and build build forms that would mimic it. And then, then kind of developing that 
armature further. And in, in the one in the center, for example, the poppies are almost like a flower arrangement into the tree. And there the reference is to the opium trade, which again has a long history with the East India Company and the opium wars with China, as well as the US intervention in Afghanistan. So, there, so there's there's multiple histories there that are that are not that are entirely global. And then they also are again about extractive um, nature, extractive aspects. So these four uh, works are very much about the symbols of extraction. I want to I, I want to show an image, um, another installation shot from the show because next I'd like to talk about these drawings, but these just give one a sense of the scale of the Christmas tree drawings and then the more intimate scale of these drawings, which I would like to look at next. This is from a series called Empire Follows Art State of Agitation. And this pairing here are two of the particularly, I think, you know, they're all very interesting, but there's a lot of information, both you know, um, representational, abstract. Uh, I'd love to hear you speak just a little bit to the one on the right, because the, the figures floating through this gorgeous drawing are telling a complicated story. <laughs> it's so complicated, right? No. Well, it is complicated for me too, as you know. I'm like, all these broad themes are very hard to um, to narrow down and discuss as specifically that, you know, the drawings refer to them, but they are not illustrations. You can't, there's, it's impossible to illustrate something that incredibly broad, but the, but the tension is what I'm after, even though I'm digging at a very intuitive level, I am interested in bringing out the tensions that are there between, between languages and between histories and between um, power dynamics. And so much of, of this entire series speaks to that. It also speaks to the colonial histories of um, movement of objects and forms and of course, movement of bodies as well. So, um, so some of that's where, that's where my iconographies are. Um, but this, uh, this, wing, this winged figure uh, yeah. that resonates throughout the images, can you just tell me a little bit about the symbology of that? Yeah. So, you know, the, there's a flight as a topic is prevalent throughout the work. When I'm um, even, even, in the for, even in the depiction of, of the fem, female protagonist or the femin, feminine forms that are in, present in the exhibition, I'm really thinking about um, their independence. So they are often very buoyant and afloat and un, sort of untethered to anything. They are not being weighed down or um, have to exist only in one, in limited ways. That's how I'm thinking that women can be proactive and be connected to the, connected to history, to past in, in uh, imaginative ways. So the idea of, 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 then the form becomes very, much about flight. It, right. it, it becomes something which is um, hovering and floating, but, but and, and carrying its own um, identity intact, carrying its um, histories and references that are all there. So that, that's one of the protagonists, the winged character, the winged forms are really, um, amplifying that idea. And often they are um, androgynous. So you can see that the, 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 the characters with the wings can be both 
male, female, or any 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 particular aspect on the spectrum. It doesn't, they, they don't have a particular gender either. So there's that happening. Then um, you also see them almost as if there's a struggle going on between between the between the, the so-called angels and and the human. But it's also sort of a reference to you know the 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 story of Jacob. It's also that there, there are many, many motives in there that intentionally will be, uh, which may be familiar to uh, biblical stories or may be familiar right. to, to the depiction of that. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm injecting an iconography that is coming from the Islamic tradition. So I'm kind of interested in that type of, uh, um, um, unexpected juxtaposition. Attention too. Not attention, tension. <laughs> yeah, that, that type of tension. Uh, this is the, uh, another series of work that's included in the exhibition. And these elements, and Adair is gonna show the clip of Reckoning so we can watch it at the end because this figure or this form relates to one of the forms that is through reckoning and I also out of this body were these two works which came I think the week that the election happened in the United States you brought those in um, so I'm just curious how this evolved as well and and then I have to say Shazir we're going to have to probably wrap it up shortly after this and go to the film yeah um Definitely, I think this is a, this is again that the hyphenated identities. <laughs> there are so many, right? But of course, the two that that I often um, get in and placed in and out of, or or seem closer. You know, there's a more in, intimate connection to them. Of course, is the Pakistani American and the Muslim American, and ex and what that what those. Um, identities as they cross paths and what it means to imagine being on either side or being inside or outside of those identities and then the and then embracing so many more more of those hyphenated identities and at, and at what time and at what stage do um, do do the hyphenated identities exit the stage, so to speak, like, you know, the more they are, the merrier they are in, in many ways for me, because then I'm not dealing with just a very um, determined position. But the idea of multiple identities is then that basically it's a return of sorts to the space where there are none. And I think that's, these are the tensions of like, um, citizen and immigrant and uh, migrant and citizen and like who gets to participate in the discussion of um, being an American. Yeah, and who gets to dictate the rules as well. Um, we, we mentioned parallax earlier and I just want to come back to that because it's one of the earlier works in the show because we did want to present a survey of, of your animated films and uh, just that kind of flow that one sees in the drawings, you see how it comes alive in the animations because this is an installation view at the gallery. And if people can come, all, all three films are on view and it's a, an incredible sensorial experience. And at this point, I would ask Adara to take over so we can watch a little bit of Reckoning because it has such an incredible soundtrack and visually it's stunning. So if we can switch to that, that would be terrific.
us that form. Yeah, we can stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi again. It's hard, it's hard to show these animations, you know? Yeah, that's why people have to come and see the exhibition. You can't show them on Zoom because they're, they're, it's never going to flow well no. or the sound disappeared a few times and the image. Yeah. Will... And, and the way it's installed in the gallery, I, you saw from the installation shot, it's it's a room and it really dominates the space and it, it is a, a a space that you enter and you feel it, you feel the sound, you feel the images flowing across you. Um, and it's really extraordinary. It's four o'clock. Um, we've used up all of our time, Shazia, because there's always so much to talk about. Um, thank you for being so generous with your time. Uh, we were talking last night, I think that Shazia has done about 50 Zoom calls talking about the exhibition with different groups, museums. Um, She's the hardest working woman in the art business, I said, and it has been true, <laughs> but it's such an extraordinary exhibition um, and your support for it has meant so much to all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you so much, Jeffrey, for walking us through the show. Well, thank you for your wonderful words. With that, we'll say goodbye. <laughs>